Well, I, I, thank you. I mean, I'll just follow on from that because I actually mm -hmm. nothing makes me more angry than the idea that the people who are running this country have got some kind of special quality for you. <laughs> I mean, there you go, the last it tells you. I don't believe you'd be a very different response in any crowd. You know, the, the fact is that they are spending their whole time trying to convince everybody that they're actually special, that they've got... I actually think that the people who are best at doing the calculations and how to actually manage on money are the people who have actually not got it. You know, we are talking millions of people having to make calculations every day as to how they're going to fund themselves and their family over the next 24 hours and so forth. And that's something which takes an enormous amount of you know, understanding yeah. of all the different figures of the cost of this and that. This is something which can be applied in many, many ways, that kind of ability to organise and to plan and so forth. It's nothing that the possession of a special class at all. On the contrary, they spend so much time trying to present themselves. I mean, the, the, the point you make about the way in which branding and so forth, I mean, you know, branding is now an epidemic. It's something which covers, you know, political parties see themselves as brands and so forth, and are constantly looking at how their image is shaped. This is an enormous amount of effort goes into this, and I want to argue, in fact, that this is something which is essentially a huge waste of human talent that what we can do under socialism is simply get rid of so much of the work that is completely unnecessary in any rational society. I've, I've mentioned advertising, so much administration, military expenditure, and all of this thing. What that means in terms of what a social society would be like, and I think it's right to say that we don't know, because the whole point is that we really are living under the pressures of a, a system which the, the Marxist word is alienated. It takes away the basic control of how you work, who you work with, what you're making. None of these things are under your control. These are all basically being told to you. That's how you earn your living. The reality is that once people do begin to have more time, one of the things we'll have, of course, will be the simple fact that lack of waste, sorry, getting rid of the waste, means that people will actually work fewer hours. You know, we will then actually have more time to develop the things which enable us as individuals to develop our talents. That, you know, we will become everywhere what by modern standards would be considered a part-time workforce if you look at the necessary labour that has to be carried out to make sure that society functions in terms of meeting the needs of food and you know, health care and sanitation and housing and all the rest of it. These things will never disappear, but they will actually shrink in a rational society as we are able to find ways of making that necessary labour more and more efficient and leaving more and more of our lives to the development of us as human beings. And I think that's what socialism really means in terms of the emancipation of people, being able to actually develop yourself as an individual, as a creative individual, you know, not basically having to, to spend your life desperately trying to, uh, to meet the needs of yourself and your, and your family. I just want to make a few other points. Um, I'm not, I apologise, I don't cover everything. Uh, I want to pick up on the point that was made right at the beginning um, about the language. Um, I mean, the, the technical phrase is, is this, is that we are not anomalous. The nature of something doesn't depend on what you call it. And I mean, it's worth remembering that um, when uh, you know, the, the Bolshevik revolution uh, was succeeded, was successful, they actually had a question about what were they going to call themselves and the parties which were being created around the world that were actually you know, following the example of, of what had happened in Russia. And they decided not to call themselves a socialist party because the word socialist had actually been discredited by the great betrayal that socialist leaders had carried out in August 1914, where almost without exception, the Bolsheviks were the exception, they actually betrayed their principles and decided to support their own governments in uh, calling for support for their own national efforts in what becomes the bloodbath of World War I. You know, so the word socialism had already been tainted by the association with, with World War I. So they call themselves communists. Yeah? Now you have a situation where many people associate the word communism with the dictatorship of Stalin, the dictatorship of Mao Zedong. And so we have to find another word in my view. I'm quite happy to call myself a workers' power person. I you know, I'll, that, that'll do me. Yeah. The reality is that what we're talking about here is not dependent on what you call it. It depends on what you're really talking about in terms of trying to change the world by putting those who are below at the moment on top. 
and those are on top, underneath. That is the essence of what we're trying to do, and I think that workers' power would do fine as a phrase that we're not going to call ourselves uh, socialists or communists. And I do take the point that I've had the other argument with people who are in Russia, or not so much in Russia, but in East Germany, as it happens, before it all collapsed, who would agree with me that, that, that it was a state capitalist regime, it wasn't socialist. And the next sentence after they'd agree with me, they'd say, and under socialism here, because of when you've been conditioned by your entire life to actually believe that the system you've got is called socialism, it doesn't change inside your brain very easily. I just want to make a couple of other points. I mean, we've got this point about, about violence. I think that the first thing we have to recognise is we live in a world which is immensely violent. You know, we, the most indescribable horrors. And I'm not just talking about the horrors of what are going on in Ukraine at the moment. I'm talking about the fact that you know, 30 million people lost their homes in Pakistan in June because of the mass floods, which are without doubt triggered by climate change. And that is that mass misery you know, is a form of violence that the system, which is based on fossil fuels and has been for 200 years, is now reaching around the world. And we're watching this obscene discussion going on in uh, Sharm el Sheikh at the moment as Boris Johnson, for God's sake, I mean, how anybody could let the man into the place to yeah. talk about how we haven't got the money. I mean, what an insult. You know, of course the money is here. If they want to meet human needs, that's what you do. You don't have to have the, the champagne parties that he was enjoying in, uh, in 10 Downing Street. We can prioritise meeting the needs of people who've lost their homes in, in Pakistan. Um, I just want to pick up on a, a couple of things. I think that um, the thing about how people can actively participate, I'm in danger of repeating my, myself a little bit here, but um, I think that we, we're in a situation where uh, I think everybody can govern. I really do. You know, I think that, you know, there's a, as I said, I'm repeating myself a bit here, that there's a myth that has been created, and I think we have to challenge that. Um, I love the point, and I others do, about you know, how um, you know, we're being asked this is an important point about, you know, to vote for people we don't know on union leaflets that are coming through our doors. I mean, that's an experience that many of us have had. I think the important thing to remember that we have a very simple idea of the union rep, the shop steward, who is the person that you elected from your own section, who you can get rid of just like that. They're not given any pay for doing the job. They're not given any privileges. You know, in fact, in some ways, they actually put themselves at risk because they're the person who has to go and have a go. Uh, you know, defend people who are being sacked and all the rest of it. They're the people who are the high profile individual in the section sometimes, more likely to be victimised perhaps than others. The point I'm getting at is they don't have any privileges. That principle where you can elect and de-elect, get rid of people and not give them any special pay and not give them any special privileges, that is actually the principle of workers' democracy as we understand it. The idea that you don't have to wait for five years to be up before you can vote somebody out you could don't have to give them a, you know, a vast amount of money to, and, and an office and a privilege, free this, that and the other, which is what our MPs get. And this is something which is a complete contrast yeah, when we are talking about what a workers' democracy, uh, a workers democracy involves. Uh, and I think I'll stop that point. Thank you. All right.